Can you lose your salvation? That's a question that many people have asked in the past and what many people still ask today. Some people will unhesitatingly say that, no, you cannot lose your salvation at all. Other people will say, yes, you can lose your salvation. And other people will say, well, I'm not sure about that. Well, I don't know where you are as you come into this program, but that's something that we're going to talk about as we continue our look at the gospel and different aspects of the gospel. And what I want to lay forth for you from the authority of the pages of scripture is that your faith is a forever faith. In other words, if you are in Christ, you cannot lose your salvation. Now, for a lot of people, that's a basic truth. But again, like I said, for other people, they're not sure or they're, or they're people who are confident that you can lose your salvation. Well, we're going to talk about it um, today, and I think we're in for a good discussion. Hope you stay with us. My name is Steve Gill, and you're listening to Loving the Scriptures. Well, we're coming off of a pretty, uh, what I would call a pretty good discussion. Um, the last week, and actually, I guess you could say the last couple weeks, as we, we spent a couple weeks um, talking about election and uh, pretty much just making a case for that. Um, I, in a way, I, I kind of feel um, as if the last couple of weeks did serve as um, a break from Acts and talking about uh, the aspects of the gospel. Um, but I, I guess I never really considered it as much because we delved into that discussion uh, which stemmed from something that we saw in Acts chapter 13, which is where we what we just finished. Um, if you're with us, you know that that the discussion stemmed from Acts 13:48, where it says, "As many who were or as uh, appointed to eternal life believed." And um, I didn't just want to breeze by that, and um, I don't know what was in the minds of uh, any of the listeners who listened to that, but I. You know, maybe there were some of you who were hoping, I, let's not breeze by that. I'm curious about that. What do you have to say about that? And so um, it wasn't a total examination of that one verse, those those uh, those last couple of weeks. Um, it was just uh, that was our starting point that stemmed from a from a larger discussion of the whole thing of, of, of election um, and just kind of hitting at some of the some of the controversy behind it and some of the objections that some people have to it. Um, and um, hopefully um, I've done an adequate job of at least getting you to think about it if you've had some doubts about that before. Um, now, some of you may have come out of those two weeks and you might have thought, well, there's so much more to this that you can talk about so much more of this that you can that you can that you can say and so many more scripture passages that you can discuss uh, when when going through this whole argumentation of, of election and predestination. Trust me, I know that. But the purpose wasn't to do an exhaustive study of of that. Hopefully, I've laid a found enough of a foundation, and given um, a, you know just adequate enough biblical reasons for you to think about if you if you are somebody who comes from the other side, um, and uh, you know if you if, you know hopefully I've given you enough to think about and to struggle with, and listen. Just in that in in that topic, just as in any other thing that we discuss on this program, if what I say and what we teach um, motivates you to look deeper into Scripture for yourself, I consider that a win. Okay, not everybody um, may have been totally convinced after the last two weeks that we've discussed this. That's fine, but if you if you are one who wants to dig into the truth. If you're one who wants to say, listen, I want to make sure that I get this right. And so I'm going to test what Steve said, said the last couple of weeks to see if what is what is what has been presented is true. That's awesome. OK, for some people, the uh, after these last couple of weeks, it's just the beginning of the journey for them. OK, um, and some of you listening to the program, if you are more on the free will side or the Armenian side, um, maybe I laid up forth the case uh adequately enough where you say, huh, um, I'm, I, I, I'm certainly more convinced of election now than I was before. Um, you know, whatever the case may be, um, you know, my hope is that you, um, 
that you really take seriously what scripture, what God's word actually says. And listen, I'm going to repeat what I said before. I understand that there's a tension in scripture. There is a tension uh, between verses that, that, that point to the fact, in my mind, indisputably, that God elects people to salvation before time, before the, before the creation of the world, that people's names are written in the Lamb's book of life before the creation of the world. That's, that's Revelation 13, 8, right? Um, you know, so God has predestined already, you know, salvation for people. Um, but I also understand that there, that the scripture also presents man's responsibility, you know, especially when you consider in the, in the sense of, of not, uh, of people who reject Christ, they are responsible for their rejection. Now, again, like I said, how does that, how does that work? How does that meld together? I, I don't know. Um, but if you're just coming into this, uh, for the first time, uh, this program, you've come at an interesting spot and you might be hearing me saying all this and saying, huh, what are some of the things that you've been talking about? Well, if that's your question on your mind, then uh, I would encourage you to go back and listen to those uh, those last couple of episodes. Um, and uh, I don't know, see what you see what you think. Um, I, I, I thought it was a that was an interesting discussion, but um, it, it kind of had that feel of taking a break from from Acts, which we kind of technically did, even though it stemmed from our study in the book of Acts, okay? And we're going to um, continue in our study of the book of Acts next time. But what I told you last time is that we're going to look at another aspect of the gospel. And if you, you just as you heard at the beginning of this episode, um, pretty much what we're going to be talking about today is um, eternal security, or um, the more, I guess, one of the more theologically sounding terms that you can put to it, I guess. Again, and this again, this goes to uh, uh, Calvinistic doctrine. One of you know, one of the things that that um, that you see in, in Calvinist uh, theology um, is it, people call it the perseverance of the saints. And when I say Calvinistic theology, let me let me tell you something. Uh, you know, whatever whatever parts of Calvinist theology that I embrace and that I that I accept, I, I don't accept those things um, because of anything that Calvin wrote um, or anything like that or any other theologian. I mean, whatever label people put on it, when I look at these things, I look at, I look at these things uh, in relation to what scripture actually says. Okay. I want to make that very clear. I was uh, reading um, I was reading a book. It was a. It was called Counterpoint. It, it was part of a series. The thing was called Counterpoint series. You might be familiar with them. I don't think they make them anymore. Um, but you know, you, if you've come across books where it says two views on this, or four views on this, or five views on this, there's one book uh, that was called Four Views on Eternal Security, and you had uh, four different authors who had their perspectives on um, uh, on eternal security. Uh, each one would write a chapter, and then each of the other three authors would write a response after the chap after that chapter. And so that would be the pattern throughout um, throughout that book. And um, there was one who was on one side of a of a Calvinist thought of eternal security, um, and so he presented everything through the chapter. And in one of the responses from one of the authors. Um, he expressed his disappointment. He's saying, well, look, you come from the Calvinist side. One of the things I was majorly disappointed in is that your chapter uh, hardly had any quotes from Calvin. And so I was reading that response and I'm like, who cares? Calvin is not the, the John Calvin is not the, the final authority on anything. If, if somebody's uh, um, argumentation is coming primarily from the word of God and not the quotes from some theologian from, from long ago, I say that's perfectly okay. I was perfectly okay of, of reading a chapter on Calvinist theology and having almost zero, I'd, I'd, I'd have to go back and check. I don't think he had any quotes from Calvin, but I think from this author's perspective, that's not what it was about. From, you know, I, maybe he took the, the, the form of a, the label of a Calvinist in this area, um, because that's just what the prevailing label is. And I, I try and be very careful with labels. Um, you know, labels can, you know, I don't want people to label me as, oh, he's the this person or he's this person as far as what I believe in theology. 
I am a believer in Jesus Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. And my number one authority is the Bible. So I have no problem reading somebody's point of view on eternal security if they if their number one source is scripture. So I was just kind of surprised and with the response from this one from this one uh, uh, author who was coming from a different perspective. He's asking, why didn't you why didn't you have any quotes of Calvin in there? Well, really, because at the end of the day, Calvin doesn't matter. You may have had some good things to say. I mean, you know, you be the judge of that yourself if you read if you read Calvin. But really, what counts is scripture, okay? That's what really counts. And so that's what I want you to hear from me, and I want you to understand that that's where I come from, okay? Uh, you'll notice um, you'll notice uh, that in the last couple of weeks when we were talking about election, I didn't provide any I didn't provide any uh, any quotes from Calvin. I went straight to scripture because that's that's really what matters. That's really what counts. Now, there might be debate or disagreement on how those those passages of scripture are interpreted. I understand that, but really the 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 central point of discussion should be around scripture. Now, if you quote from somebody else because you think that they are speaking on something that you think is worded great based on something that scripture says, I think that's okay. But I mean, if we're having a problem with somebody not quoting Calvin, you know, I, I just think, really? I mean, I, I, I don't see the problem. Um, I don't see the problem here. I, I'm, I was very well, I was very much okay with the fact that this person who wrote this chapter in this book, um, didn't quote Calvin. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm totally fine with that. So <laughs> anyway, um, not to, not to go out, go off on a tangent here, but, uh, j- but again, we're just going, we're going to be talking about eternal security, um, in the, in the Calvinist, uh, uh, circle um it's called perseverance of the saints some people some people use the term once saved always saved which i i i do not think that that's a good term um i know what people are trying to say but there are people who have severe misunderstandings about the gospel number one um and then number two how the security of the believer works and so they throw around the term once saved always saved with uh, which sprinkled in the whole thing as, as are some misunderstandings of how that whole thing works. And what ends up happening is you have uh, people uh, spouting off things that they shouldn't be spouting off. Um, um, I'll, and I'll probably, ex- I'm not going to take a lot of time this time to explain why I have a, I have a problem with that term once saved, always saved. I'll probably reserve that for next time we, we take a break from Acts because it kind of, it'll kind of fit in more, um, to what we have to talk about on that side of the next time we talk about something about the gospel. Okay. Um, but you know, eternal security is another one of those, or I, you know, it's one of those things that, again, it's one of those controversial topics, but it's not. The con- let me say this, the controversy isn't in the same form as it would be um, from what we've looked at before um, with, uh, with election and predestination. With election, it just kind of seems like there's one side and another side, and there are people on both sides who, who stand staunchly on their, um, on their beliefs, on what they believe the Bible says about those things. Sometimes the debate can get pretty heated, um, and sometimes unfortunately people divide over that and i don't i don't think they have to that's the tragedy of the whole thing um but it's one but the controversy of that whole teaching is that you have people who are very who very are, are very uh, passionate about these things and they might argue passionately about those things and the controversy is so much to the point that sometimes you have people who divide over it unfortunately um with eternal security or perseverance of the saints whatever you want to call it i uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to go with perseverance of the saints. Probably I'm going to want to use that term more because even with eternal security, it's kind of, eh. um, I mean, just as far as how people use the term and how they, how they, you know, yeah. But anyway, um, it's, I, I think you can still chalk it up as a controversial topic. Um, but for it, but it's not in the same manner and it's not in the same form as what you see with election. Most of the time with eternal security or perseverance of the saints, you know, it's, it's, um, I don't see a lot of people arguing passionately from like one group against another group. Um, a lot of times the controversy, uh, 
Uh, and you know what? It may not even be a controversy. It's just a matter of just uh, there's just a wide sense of uncertainty. Now you have people on both sides. You have people who will who will definitely say you can lose your salvation, and then you have people on the other side who will definitely say you cannot lose your salvation. But I don't see passionate, heated debate over eternal security like you do with something like election versus free will. A lot of the a lot of the uncertainty of of eternal security has to do with a lot of people who just aren't sure. You know, they have they ask the question, can you can you lose your salvation? And for some people that creates a great amount of fear in their soul. Because now they're kind of wondering if I done some things or a number of things um that will uh that will result in God taking away my salvation. So there's uncertainty and there's and even with people who believe that you can you can lose your salvation. Um, again, I, you know, for some of those people, it's not really from a teaching position where he said, this is the doctrine that I believe and I'm going to teach it. It's just a thought in their mind that comes from misunderstandings or even I'm not, maybe not even misunderstandings, but ignorance of the gospel. See, this is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm, I'm taking breaks every once in a while in highlighting a certain aspect of the gospel, because I do believe that there's a lot of misunderstanding and or ignorance on the gospel. And if we just understood some of the things of this whole thing of, and of scripture, um, you know, what scripture says about these things, I think that that would really dispel in a large sense um, some of the misunderstandings that people have, which will result in them not saying things that are false, um, if that makes any sense, you know. But in, in order to go through some of these things, we have to touch on doctrine. And unfortunately, people aren't interested in doctrine. They're, they, they, they don't, a lot of people don't like to use their head. They just want, they just want to go by the heart and the emotions and, and goosebump, ooey gooey feelings. Listen, that's not all the whole thing of the Christian life. You have to use your brain. You have to use your head. You have to graduate from kindergarten every once in a while, you know, and if we understand these things and listen, you think that we lay forth, they aren't, they aren't PhD level type things. Hopefully what I'm going to show you today, you're going to see that you don't need a PhD to understand these things. Um, you know, but uh, you know, it's just a matter of, we have to, and listen, I'm not painting everybody with a broad brush, but I do believe that there are large groups of people. Um, where the ignorant, where the ignorance comes from, as far as their lack of understanding of the gospel, really just comes from spiritual laziness. People don't want to dig deeper into scripture, and that's unfortunate. And I do believe it's true, so I have no qualms saying that there are a lot of people who spiritually are lazy. And my encouragement to you is that get off the spiritual couch, if we want to go with the go with the terminology here. Put some effort into looking into into the things of Scripture. That's why I say if you leave these times um, on loving the Scriptures that motivates you to looking deeper into Scripture and certain things, I think that's a win. That is a win in my book, okay? Um, and so um, I would just encourage you, um, you know, to, uh, you know, with the help of the Holy Spirit um, to, you know, to, to look deeper into some of these things that we talk about. And the Holy Spirit, who who illumines the Scripture, I think, will help you along in those in in that journey. Okay. Now, I guess that's enough of a monologue. I don't I, I don't intend to make these things monologue sometimes, but sometimes I sometimes I end up I end up doing that. But um, with this whole thing of eternal security, I want I want to focus on the words of Jesus Christ Himself. We don't have to do an exhaustive exploration of of Scripture to say, okay, it talks about uh, the perseverance of the saints here, 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 and here, and look at all the scriptures that are available. Um, but, and again, I'm, I'm just going to reserve that for you. If you want to look deeper into scripture, when we leave this time, uh, leave this time. Okay. Do an exploration. Um, look at, if you have Bible study tools, start using those, start whipping those out and everything. Um, if you don't know what those are, uh, you know, you can ask your pastor at your, at your church, you know, ask them what are some, some good tools to use or concordances, um, maybe in the back of your Bible. Some of them are exhaustive, um, you know, and there are a lot of tools available um, that you can use to kind of further your study on certain things. Um, but 
Um, I'm, I'm looking at John chapter 10. Um, and John chapter 10, if you're familiar with scripture, John t- chapter 10 is a very, um, I guess maybe you could say a beloved chapter in the beloved book written by the beloved disciple who is John, right? Um, and in chapter 10, uh, we're just going to, we're only going to be looking at a few verses um, in chapter 10, but to set the stage here, uh, you know, chapter 10 is, is, uh, is the chapter where, where Jesus says of himself, um, I am the good shepherd, right? Um, and so in, uh, in the latter part and the latter half of this, of this chapter, Jesus is going to bring up the, the analogy of, of the shepherd sheep, uh, illustration again, you know, he's in, in another occasion, um, you know, uh, during the feast and in, in verse 22 of chapter 10, this it, it lays out the, the occasion in which Jesus lays this out. Um, where it says this is at the Feast of Dedication. And basically what you have during the time of this feast, you had some people, you know, the Jews and Jewish uh, religious leaders and people come up to Jesus. Um, Jesus is very well known by this point, obviously. They've heard him teach, um, and um, they're just not getting it, okay? These are blind religious Jews um, who don't get it. These are people who are of the caliber of what Jesus spoke about in John chapter 8, who said that you are of your father the devil, right? Uh, the same type of people, the same people. And um, um, basically they come up to Jesus and say, um, y- if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus goes on and says, I did tell you that te- the, my works really testify about me. That's, you know, but you, but you refuse to recognize and you refuse to believe because you are not of my sheep. Okay. Now here's again where he brings up the whole, sh- the whole thing of sheep. Once again, he told them about it before in another occasion in the same chapter in chapter 10. And one of the things that you see in chapter 10 is that they, even with that, they didn't really understand everything that he was, that he was telling them, which really illustrates the, the blindness of, of, of their hearts where they weren't able to see where Jesus was going with all of this. Um, but here he brings up the whole thing of, of sheep again. And so I want to start out, I want to start in, um, in verse 27, okay? Basically, what we're going to be, we're just going to be looking at verses 27 through 30, okay? Um, and I think that this, that this passage really does a great, it, just in those few verses, speaks much to the, the reality of the perseverance of the saints, okay? And so here's what you have here. In, um, in verse 27, uh, well, let me read verses 27 through 30, and then let me go back to verse 27, and we'll, ta- and we'll talk about something. Okay, so in verse 27, this is Jesus speaking to the Jews. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now, th- I mean, that, that verse, uh, those, those, those passages of Scripture, really does speak a great deal to the security of the believer, okay? And it shows us that if, you are, if we are in Christ, we are safe and secure in the hands of God. I want you to staple that to your heart and to your mind. The reality, the truth that you are safe and secure in the hand of God. Okay? Now, let's go back. I want to I want to I want to unpack some things just a little bit. Um just to kind of to to flush out this 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 whole concept a little bit more. Because when we when we just read through this, I mean there's nothing wrong, wrong with reading through this, but I think something that's true for all of us um, when we're reading through scriptures, that there are some things that we can pick up when we read th- when we do a read through, and there's also other things that we miss. And sometimes when we just read through some things, we look over so- certain things that are vitally important to our understanding of, of of particular texts. And I think that this is that this is the case with this here. So when we consider um, again, let's go back to verse 27. Uh, where, where he says that my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. You know, one of the things, you know, it, it's interesting, you know, Jesus just isn't using this, this, 
um, this illustration of sheep and shepherd and just pulling it out of thin air. Um, it, w- it would have had much more meaning to the people at that time um, than it would here in the United States um, and particularly even in, in urban areas. Um, you know, in other places of the world, this might have a little bit more meaning, um, you know, for, you know, just really understanding what, what Jesus says. But we have to understand, you know, that there were, there, there were many shepherds um, back in that day. And in that land, I mean, we even think about when Jesus was was born. Who did the who did God and who did the angels appear to? They appeared to shepherds who were watching, keeping watch over their flock by night. Right? You know, um, you know, you had, uh, you know, even in the Old Testament, David was a shepherd. You know, he, he was a that was you had a lot of shepherds um, at that time, and so people understood the whole thing about about shepherds and sheep and things like that. Now, you don't necessarily have to be an expert at shepherding sheep to know and to understand that one of the things that that a shepherd does is to protect the flock, to protect his sheep, okay? The shepherd was very protective of his flock, okay? And you see that, again, you see the illustration of shepherd and sheep in other in other parts of Scripture. Jesus wasn't the first person to do this. I mean, you think about the psalmist. And just let me just point this out here in, uh, in Psalm 95. Um, in Psalm 95, um, and uh, in verses, uh, let me read verses six and seven of Psalm 95, where it says, um, yeah, six and yeah, verses six and seven of, of, of Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And listen, and we are the people of his pasture. It's that sh- sheep language, sheep shepherd language. Okay, he doesn't call us sheep directly here, um, the writer of this psalm, but it does speak of us being in a pasture, um, you know. And well, he does call us sheep in the in the next in the last part of there in verse seven. But again, that the whole thing of of being sheep under his care, he says, "For uh, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand." That term, the sheep of his hand, speaks of something where. Where, where we are under his care. We are under his protective care, right? We think about, we think about Psalm 23. You know, most people know Psalm 23. How does, well, how does that go? The Lord, is my, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, just read the whole, that whole psalm and you'll see the, the, the characteristics of a shepherd that looks after and protects his sheep. And so when Jesus brings out this, this whole illustration understand that that's a very significant illustration that the very uh very uh impactful word picture if we really want to get this whole idea of the security of the believer down in our heads we have to understand we have to know we have to familiarize ourselves with the concept that a shepherd was one who looked after and protected the sheep you know, Jesus was one who even says, I laid down my life for the sheep. That's very, that's, that's definitely shepherd language. A shepherd would not be worth his salt if he was lackadaisical, um, if he was, if he was lazy, if he was negligent in his duties of protecting the sheep. Okay. Now you also have this idea of, um, a shepherd, you know, a shepherd was what was one who, um, really loved the sheep. I mean, there there was a tendency where where there was, and even with the sheep, the sheep, uh, the sheep would would love on the uh, would would love the shepherd as well. You know, as as you as the there was continual care between uh from from the shepherd towards the sheep. There was there was kind of a a bond there. You know, kind of you know anybody who has a pet would would kind of know what that's like. Um, you know, and so that you you kind of had that that um you know, the closeness there. And there was, there was real genuine care between the, between the shepherd and between the shepherd and the sheep. Right. And, um, you know, that's, and again, when Jesus uses sheep language in other, in other parts of scripture, he talks about his love, um, for his sheep, you know, we are. So all of this to say is that we, as, as, as people who are in Christ are under his care, are under the care of Christ. And Christ is in the business and in the duty of protecting his sheep and protecting his flock. Okay. 
Now, what, what we're talking about with protection, when we're talking about protection, we're not talking necessarily talking about protection from um, the physical, material things of the world. You know, so you know, because we are his sheep, we're we're protected from car accidents and 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 natural disasters and things like that. That's not what we're talking about. And I think we know that that's that's true. Many of us, unfortunately, know people, Christians, whether they are close to us or not, um, who have been victims of things of this world. You know, I mean, and even just look at the Book of Acts. Um, what we've been looking at in the Book of Acts, persecution. We're you know the believers weren't protected from persecution. Now, sometimes God rescued people from persecution. We saw that in the case of Peter in chapter 12, right? Um, but as we, even as we go further in chapter in, in, in the book of Acts, um, and we're even going to see it, um, just as we go along, it was when she started into chapter 14, it seems like persecution continues to be a reality. Um, you know, and it's, and it is harmful. Um, so, you know, we have to set our mind straight on what we're talking about here when we're talking about the shepherd protecting his sheep. Now, now again, God does protect people in certain situations, certain, uh, in certain circumstances from actual forms of persecution. I'm not, I don't, I'm not one to say that he doesn't do that at all, but I'm not, but I'm saying that that's not a guarantee in life. And even when we talk about the things of life, um, you know, there, there are a lot of things that we are very vulnerable to. Okay. But the protection that we're talking about here is a spiritual protection. Okay. That's the context by which Jesus is laying all of this out to his audience. Okay. That this is a spiritual protection. Okay. And this is a, and this is a spiritual intimacy that we're talking about too. You notice that, that, uh, that it says there in that verse in verse 27, where Jesus says, and I know them. That's very intimate language. You know, he knows, he knows all of us. I believe it's earlier in that chapter where Jesus says that he calls his sheep by name. You know, God knows you. Jesus knows you personally, intimately, um, better than you know yourself. Okay. And, um, and not only does he know them, but the sheep follow him. You know, if you go with the with the analogy, and again, something that Jesus talks about earlier in the chapter, I keep making references to to things that he said earlier in the chapter, which I hope will lead you again, you know, as far as things outside of this time of this program, I hope that leads you to going to chapter 10 and reading through that chapter, the parts that we haven't covered. And in fact, if you're going to do that, I would encourage you not to start with chapter 10, but go to chapter 9. Because chapter nine leads into chapter ten, and and you know, and everything. So, just so you get a fuller picture of the occasion on which Jesus was was talking about those things in the earlier part of chapter ten. So, I'd encourage you to start with chapter nine and read through read through chapter ten. That would be my that would be my suggestion to you. But, um, um, but uh, you know, the the sheep follow him, and and they they don't follow a stranger. You know, and so there's, so again, there's that, there's that whole thing where there's the, there's an intimate tie between the shepherd and the sheep. The the shepherd knows the sheep. He calls the sheep by name. Okay. And, uh, and the sheep know his voice and they follow after him. Okay. So again, if we look at Jesus Christ as our shepherd, we are under the care of our shepherd, Jesus Christ. He, he looks after us. He protects us. You know, to to use a to use a phrase, another an, another phrase um, that we see in other parts of Scripture. You see it in Hebrews. You see it in Romans, where where it says that the Son, which obviously we know is Christ, intercedes on our behalf to the Father. You know, and I believe that as a shepherd, that's something that's really something that that falls into his 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 thing. That you know, just sort of the things that he does for us. Okay. Now, I, I think it's important for us to understand, uh, again, that um, all of this is by the grace of God. If we want to talk about the security of the believer, we have to understand, we have to, we have to remind ourselves of this, the reality of the grace of God. Uh, and, and not only that, but the continuing nature of God's grace. Let's put it that way. When we think about God's grace, we usually, a lot of times we think about God's grace at the moment of salvation. You know, it's by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, you know, that sort of thing. You know, it's by God's grace that we have been, that we have been saved, that we've been taken out of danger, um, that we've been taken out of the dangers of, of eternal destruction 
and we've been taken out of the domain of darkness and we've been put into the kingdom of God's beloved son, right? We, we, we know if you're familiar with scripture, you're familiar with the language, you're, you're familiar with the jargon, right? And, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're familiar with grace and we understand that it, that that works. There's nothing that we could have done, uh, nothing to merit, um, uh, our, any sort of favor with God. You know, it's not by, not by our works, um, that, that we've, that we've come into salvation. We're, fa- we're familiar with those sorts of things, but it just seems interesting to me that when it, that, that that's how we think when it comes to our salvation, but nobody seemed, well, I shouldn't say nobody, I'm sure, but a lot of people, a good number of people don't seem to transfer that concept into the whole thing where, uh, even after salvation, after we've received our salvation, that grace still applies. Grace doesn't end. Grace doesn't shut off once we've come to Christ. And that's very important to understand because here's the thing, you know, a lot of, you know, some people will, will think that, um, will think that, um, uh, you know, if, if you, if you go too much down the wrong path, then there comes a point where God will take away your salvation. Now, I would ask whoever says that, number one, can you back that up by scripture? Because I know of no such passage of scripture that, 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 that would say that. And number two, if it doesn't take works for you to get into salvation, how in the world does it take, how in the world would we conclude that our works determines whether we keep our salvation or not? That's one of the most logical questions that come to my mind when it comes to this whole thing. If it didn't take works for you to get in, what makes you believe that works helps us to sustain our salvation? I mean, it, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Now, again, when people say, when people have this belief that there, that there comes a point that if you do too many bad things then God will, then you'll lose your salvation. That comes from a, a, a severe misunderstanding of how salvation works, how the gospel works. Um, and again, we'll go into more detail of that next time. Well, not next time next week, but next time we get into the aspects of the gospel, it goes into this whole thing of having a misunderstanding of regeneration. That's probably what we're going to talk about the next time we take a break, uh, take a break from the book of Acts. And when people believe things about losing your salvation and, you know, people, you know, sinning all day long, and so they must lose their salvation at one point. Um, I hear those people and I say, you don't understand a good part of what makes up the good news of the gospel and what happens as a result of our salvation. And regeneration is one of those things that people just don't seem to understand. And I can't wait to get into that once we, once we, once we get, once we get there. Um, but for now, you know, just understand that this is all by the grace of God. And this is all just as, just as salvation is all the work of God in our lives. So is, are the other things in our lives as we continue to walk in our newfound salvation, you know, and we're all under the care and protection of our shepherd, who is Jesus Christ, right? So we're under his care as his sheep and we follow him. Now in verse 28, it says, I, and this is Jesus talking. He says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Okay, now, notice that I give them eternal life. I give them eternal life. Now, you know, this this should sound familiar. I mean, just from what we know is written later um, by Paul in Romans chapter in Romans chapter six, right? He says the wages of sin is the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord, right? The gift of God is eternal life. Now, remember, we talked about eternal life a little bit a few weeks ago. And remember uh, that a lot of what goes into the whole eternal life thing is, is a relationship with God himself and with, and with Christ. Um, so there's a quality of life as well as a quantity. It's not, just, it's not just a quantity of life, but it's a quality of life. But if we're talking about the security of the believer, we need to acknowledge that, there, that the quantity of life still applies. It is eternal life. It, you know, we're just not just using phrases willy-nilly here. I mean, just because it's not just quantity of life, but quality of life doesn't mean that the quantity doesn't apply. It certainly does. And what is the quantity of that life? Eternal. Eternal. 
It's it's ongoing. It's eternal. See, we use these phrases, but sometimes we really don't consider or think about you know what they actually mean in a very obvious way, right? Eternal life is eternal life. Okay. It is eternal. Now, I I know again. I've said that you know everybody will live forever. Everybody who comes into this world, because everybody who doesn't have Christ and they're eternally condemned. I mean, they don't. You know, their their life isn't snuffed out. There is no annihilationism. So again, there's that whole understanding of combining the quantity with the quality, and that's the difference between the believer and the unbeliever. Okay, so with the believer, there's the quantity, but there's also the quality. And, and eternal life begins when we come into come come to faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, and eternal life doesn't start when we die and we're with the Lord in, in, in heaven. Eternal life is now. We are experiencing eternal life right now. We are in Christ. Okay, and this is something, listen, this is something that Jesus Christ has given us. And according to Romans 6, 23, it is a gift. It is a gift of God that is given to us out of love for us, okay? Now, I don't know of anywhere in Scripture where it talks about eternal life being de-gifted from us, right? It's not, it's not, it's not something that's, that's de-gifted. Now, of course, you know, I, I understand that when I say something like that, I'm arguing from, from the whole thing of silence, um, which you have to be careful about doing, but I feel confident of doing that and saying that not there's that that there isn't anywhere where it says that that eternal life can be taken away from you. There's nothing explicitly out there that says that, but I can say that with much confidence because of what Scripture continues to say, particularly what this verse continues to say. Do you notice here? It says, "I give them eternal life, and they will never perish." Underline that word in your mind: never. Never. Now, again, we're familiar with John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life or everlasting life, right? We're, we're very familiar with that so that, uh, so that we will not perish, but have, it will have eternal life. Now here, it's just interesting that, you know, just, um, just the permanent nature of what we know about it, about eternal life and not perishing from John 3, 16, in John three sixteen, so that it says that we will not perish. Now, how now how how secure is that? Well, Jesus lays that out right here in in, in John chapter ten. They will never perish. They will never perish. Can I say that one more time? They will never perish. You, if you are in Christ, will never. Perish, and the, the whole thing of perishing, in the context of Scripture, and especially in the Book of John, is talking about the again. We're talking about the spiritual, not talking about physical death or anything. It, it's talking about the, the the spiritual. You know, we will never we will never spiritually perish. We are spiritually we've been saved, and now, as it says here, um, as we are in the care of of God and the protective hand of Christ, our Shepherd, He will protect us, and we will never. So we've received this gift of eternal life by, by the grace of God. That's what we've received. And so we've, we're given this promise here that we, will, that we will never perish. And so this is just one of the clear indications of Scripture where you don't have to ask these questions or, or latch on to, the, to, the, to these teachings that people say or to say that you can lose your salvation. And, you know, you'll say, oh, well, yeah, you know, if you, if, you, if you go down the wrong path, then, you know, you'll... Your, your salvation will be lost and blah, blah, blah. Well, no. It says here that, you, that they will never perish. Okay? They will never perish. And it goes on to say in that verse, and no one, no, notice the absolute terms here, never, right? And no one, okay? And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Okay? His whole thing of snatching, the idea is, 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 is a, a snatching, a taking away of it in an, in an aggressive nature. Now, when you're talking about a shepherd, you know, the shepherd is one who, who protects the sheep, 
you know, and obviously we know that there are dangers out out in the field and stuff with with bears and lions. David spoke about this. He says, I had to go against lions and bears who tried to take away the sheep. You know, there were dangers to the sheep. Wolves would, would go after the sheep to, to destroy the sheep. Right. And so what you I mean, and, and you know, if you have a, an animal that that drags a, a, an animal or sheep away by its teeth and drags it away to have dinner. Um, you know, that's what you, that's what you have there. It's a very, you know, in the world of nature, there's a very aggressive sort of way where you had predators who would go after animals like sheep. And so the shepherd, it, his job, and again, David lays this out, even when he's making his case before King Saul to go against, to, for him to go against Goliath. He said, I've many times I've been faced with lions and bears, um, in front of me and I, and I killed them to, in protection of, in protection of the sheep, Right. Now, here's the difference between a human shepherd and the, and the divine shepherd that we have in Jesus Christ is that some can, can a shepherd fail in his duty of protecting all of the sheep? Were there times, um, certainly where, where, uh, where a, a, a lion or a bear would succeed in what he was trying to do in taking off some of the sheep? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that there were cases, uh, where that happened, but with Jesus, it's different. Because we are in the divine protective hand of our God, our leader, our Savior. And so he himself says from his very own mouth, he says that no one will snatch them out of my hand. Now, notice what he does in verse 29. In verse 29, you know, because in verse 28, he's talking about himself. And in verse 29, he brings the father into this as well. He says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. Okay. Now a couple of things to, to notice here, my father who has given them to me. Okay. Notice that whole thing who has given them to me. Now, Jesus has used that term before and it's in, and it's in John chapter six. And I want to draw your attention to that. But let's just lay out, let's lay out the truth and the reality right now is that you and I, if you're in Christ, you and I are a love gift from the father to the son. Okay. Now I think that that is that, that in itself, if we just sit and think about that kind of speaks to the security, it speaks to the security issue. Um, because I don't think, and again, I'm, I'm somewhat speaking from silence here, but again, I mean, if you just think about this, I don't think. God the Father would give God the Son a non-secure love gift. These are the people that I give you, and uh, some of them might stay, and some of them might not. You know, all of this really, if you think about it, goes back to the whole thing of of God's sovereignty and salvation. So this kind of touches on some of the things that we talked about in the last couple of weeks when he talked about election, right? All of this is under. We see that's the thing. This is all under the under the under the whole umbrella of God's sovereignty in salvation you know God is God is able to give his son a love gift and he's able to give them the love gift of people who will follow him and who will not fall away okay now we know that these people will not fall away when we look at uh when we look at chapter six and uh this is Jesus's words to the Jews um, again, this is one of his long discourses here. Um, and, uh, let's see verse, uh, verse 37. Um, all that the father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Did you catch that? That's, that's John chapter six, verse 37. Now, again, remember, look at, look at what it says there. All that the father gives me. That's what we see Jesus talking about in, in chapter 10 right? So he says, all that the father gives me will come to me. Okay. So again, there's that whole thing of sovereignty of salvation. We can bring into the whole discussion of the effectual call, right? Which we, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago. I think that you can add that you see sort of that concept in what Jesus is saying there, but there's a, there's that predetermined group of, of people who, uh, who God is reserved as a love, as a love gift for his son to give to the son. And they will come to Christ. All that the Father gives, gives has given me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Okay. 
And I think you can, either way that you look at it, whether you look at it where as somebody comes to Christ and he, and he says, I will not drive somebody away who comes to me initially, or if you look at it um, in the sense that, uh, you know, you can also look at it in the sense that, you know, they, they, they come to Christ and then throughout that whole time um, that they're connected to Jesus Christ as a shepherd, he will never cast them out. As long as they are together, he will never cast them out. It's an impossibility. And you might want to think of it along those lines because one of the things that Jesus will say later on in that chapter in John chapter 6 is that he will raise them up at the last day. You know, so these people who come to him, Jesus says himself, I will raise them up in the last day. That's uh, particularly in verse 40, I think. Um, he says it a few other times in this in the in chapter six, but yeah, I know he says it in verse forty. For this is the will of my Father that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. And we know that when we have eternal life, we will never perish, right? Okay, everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. And I will I will raise him up on the last day. Boom! There you go. That speaks of security to me. And so it's, it's, it's in the bank. It is in the bank. And so when you go back to John chapter 10, you know, it talks about, again, it says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. And the same thing here with the father is the same thing with the son. And none, and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. Okay. So nobody will, will snatch him out of the son's hand. No one will, will snatch him out of the father's hand. Now notice here, when, it, when Jesus is relating this whole thing to himself in verse 28 of John chapter 10, um, he says, no one will snatch them out of, my, uh, out of my hand. Okay. And then with the father, it says, no one is able to snatch. Now, I'm not, no, I think both, both cases are true for both people. I don't think anybody is able to snatch them out of the out of the son's hand, and no one will snatch snatch the sheep out of the father's hand. But it, it, but it just comes to this whole thing of no one will snatch them out of God's hand because nobody is able to. Okay. Now you think now wait a minute though. What about these situations where you where somebody has claimed Christianity and then they go off and follow some sort of heretical cult or something? They said that they believed at one point and then they went off and uh, they joined the Jehovah's Witnesses or they maybe they renounced their faith altogether because of something else. Doesn't that seem like God is not protective of his own? Well, here's the thing. That's the, if that happens with somebody that proves that they were not of God in the first place. They were they weren't part of the pasture. They weren't part of the sheepfold. All I have to do is is take it is take it to first John two nineteen which pretty much says that you know anybody who walks away from that proves that they were that they never belonged to Christ in the first place read that that's that's just a paraphrase but read that that's 1 John 2:19 look it up for yourself okay and so when you read when you read uh, certain places like um, like in colossians um, let me read this to you cuz some this will confuse some people sometimes like in colossians chapter 1 um, uh, where it says in verse 21 and following, it says, and you who were once, uh, who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Um, you know, so it, you know, some people will latch on to what it says there in verse 23. It says, if indeed you continue in the faith and they say, well, see, there you go. You know, if somebody doesn't continue in the faith, doesn't that mean that somebody is not as secure as we think they are? But again, if we go to the concept of what John says in first John two nineteen, what we see there and what we see in situations with what Paul is laying out there in Colossians is somebody doesn't persevere. What that's saying is, is that that person was never part of the fellowship to begin with. They were never part of part of their sheep, you know, and that's the thing. There are a lot of people who are deceived as, as to whether they are believers or not. But see, that's one of the problems that we have in, in, in 21st century evangelical Christianity today in America. We just think that if somebody prays a prayer that they're in the club and that's all that it takes. <laughs> 
Now, of course, I've spoken on that extensively. I believe it was way back in, I want to say, episode 40, when I talked about repentance. If you want a more fuller discussion of that, go back to that episode. Um, but it's not a matter of say a prayer and you're in. That's 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 shoddy. That's that's that that's not what it's about. I'm not saying that people who pray to prayer aren't genuinely saved. I'm sure that many genuinely pray to prayer and they and they were and you know, but a prayer doesn't save anybody. And you have a lot of people who are praying prayers and they don't even know what they're praying because they haven't really been given uh, an adequate presentation of the gospel to begin with. They just hear, hey, if I repeat these words, that means I'm going to go to heaven when I die. And that's all it is for them. It's just it's just insurance that they won't go to hell when they when they leave this earth. And that's gonna that's going that's going into a, another topic of of conversation. You know, that we don't need to go into, and I've covered that before. Um, but that's what you have there. So, in the true sense of people who are truly of the she, uh, of of the shepherd, who are in the hands of God the Father and Jesus the Son. Nobody will snatch us out of their hands because no one is able to, which really speaks of the strength of God and his work in us. You know, the power of God in salvation at the beginning is the same power of God that is at work throughout our lives as we are in, as we are participants in that faith, in that salvation. Doesn't Paul say in Philippians, he who began a good work will will carry it on to completion? Until the day of Christ Jesus, isn't that what Scripture says? I mean, there are so many things that are laid out clearly in Scripture that for some reason people just choose to ignore for some reason. Or again, maybe they just don't know that those things are in there. But again, it's just one of those things where it's one of those things where I scratch my head and I wonder why do well, I, I, I ask I ask the question, but then the answer always comes up in my mind. And again, we'll talk about it a little bit more next time we take a next time we take a break from the book of Acts. But it's no mystery to me. I mean, it's just like, it, why do people make things more complicated than they need to be? Uh, you know, it, 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 you know, the people invent all sorts of things about how your salvation isn't secure. And we look at places like John chapter ten, where it seems for, where it seems pretty clear that it is. Of course, it is. And you see there in verse thirty, it says, "I and the Father are one." You know, you know why, it, you know, you, you notice it says there that no one will snatch him out of, out of the son's hand or the father's hand. You know what that's saying is that you, you can't, they can't do that because I and the father are both God. Now, nobody can overpower God. Nobody can steal anything that's in God's hands. They just can't. And that goes in and, you know, listen, you know, you think about, well, you know, you don't know my situation. Um, I feel really bad about this, this, and this, and and that sort of thing or the other. Listen, I understand that people struggle through thoughts like that, but again, let me let me turn your attention to um, to Romans chapter eight, where Paul says, "For I am sure," and he's not saying I'm some I'm you know I, I'm I'm kind of sure. No, no, no. He's sure. He's certain. I'm sure. That neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. There again, nothing is able to separate you. And, and he gives a you know a good representative list of what that looks like. Okay. So if you're wondering about Am I secure in my salvation? If you are in Christ, the, the, the answer to that question is a resounding yes. You are in his hand and nothing, no one, you know, will be able to snatch, snatch you aggressively out of your shepherd's hand. You are fully protected, protected by the power of God. And, and I think, I would, you know, let me just, this just came to mind. I, I, hopefully I can find it here. Um, it comes to... Um, Let's see, First Peter, I think, um, mentions, um, let, me, let me start in chapter 1, verse 3 of, of, of First Peter here, and I'll read into it. I think this is where, where, I, where I'm looking at here. All right, this is Peter. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. He has caused us. Notice that? He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead 
to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Do you notice that? That's verse 5. Verse 5 of 1 Peter 1. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. All of this speaks of God's power. God's power was at work in, in, in the initial point of salvation, and God's power is still at work in the midst of it. And that's what we have to understand. God's power didn't go away. God's grace didn't go away. It's all his work. And we're going to see that even as we go further, even after we talk about regeneration, we're going to see how this works even further once we, once we talk about other aspects of the gospel. So I hope you're I hope you're excited in, in, in unpacking this whole thing a little bit more um, once we once we get there. But we're going to leave it there. And next time we're going to we're going to start up in, in Acts chapter 14. We've kind of been away from the narrative flow um, of of Acts for a while, but now we're going to get back into it. Um, we're going to we're going to see some more trials and troubles. We'll see a little bit of triumph in the story of Paul and Barnabas as they're as they're as they're engaged in this uh, first uh, missionary journey, and and hopefully you'll you'll be able to uh, gather some valuable things just as it relates to ministry. And again, when I say ministry, I'm not just talking about missions ministry or pastoral ministry, but any sort of ministry. It could be personal ministry to to somebody that you're trying to reach for Christ or or a group of people or whatever. So I hope you you come back for that, okay? But if you like this show, if you've discovered this for the first time, you like what you hear, or you've been with me for a while, and you like and you like the show, and you haven't done so already, I would I would encourage you to subscribe to my show on iTunes and on and on Google Play. Um, you can also uh, check out Loving the Scriptures on Twitter. Uh, the handle is at lt scripts at l t s c r i p t s, which stands for loving the scriptures. All right, friends, remember you are secure in Christ. Take that home with you. Look at scripture for yourself in other areas. Um, and, uh, you'll, you'll be exposed. I promise you to the wonderful promises having to do with God's security of you, his grace, his mercy, all of those things that still stand right now for us as believers. It didn't just apply to us just at the beginning and then went away as we as we walk more into salvation. There are things that are still true for us today. All right, take that home from the bank, and uh, I hope that you're encouraged by that. Okay, well, my name is Steve Gill, and I hope to see you here next time. Bye now. <laughs>